Uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Adam McDaniel. I'm the writer, director, producer of Amsel, illustrator of the Lost Art. And uh, first and foremost, um, I wanted to thank everyone for their support and compliments over the years, the long gestation of this project. For those of you who have donated to the project, uh, all my thanks. For those of you who have provided uh, emotional or creative support, all my heartfelt thanks. Um, so I'll start off first. Uh, a question that I often receive is, how do you pronounce Richard Amsel's last name? And it's kind of funny, even in the film, we're going to have a little montage, which kind of mocks this, because all the different interview subjects pronounce the last name differently. And uh, for the record, um, I've confirmed with a family member that uh, if you pr the last name is pronounced Amsel. So think about artist easel, easel, Amsel. Um, but uh, even close friends of his, he did an interview one time with a public access New York show called The Emerald City. And the host of that program pronounced his last name as Amzel, with the emphasis on the second syllable. Yeah. And uh, I was that an affectation that Richard specifically requested for that interview? I don't know. Uh, I'd spoken with David Bird, who was also on that program, along with Richard. And uh, David wasn't aware that Richard might have requested it, but uh, the pronunciation is Amsel. It's kind of a funny thing I just wanted to get out of the way. So that aside, I wanted to get some status updates on the project. Um, so first and foremost, there's going to be uh, a special event uh, hosted by the Society of Illustrators uh, in New York City. On September 9th, Richard is going to be inducted into their Hall of Fame. I'm going to be flying to New York for that event. They've given me permission to film it for the documentary. Um, some of you are going to be there. I look forward. Please reach out to me and we'll reconnect. Um, I'm also doing more interviews for the film. I mean, I've uh, conducted over 60 interviews over the last eight years and uh there but there are still interviews i wish to do um including a number of celebrities and uh the past month i have been sending out individual customized press kits to various celebrities and and filmmakers and such uh who amsel either worked with or did portraits of and uh, trying to make a last mad dash, desperate hope that more people will participate. But as things stand, we have more than enough material um, to create a fully fledged film. And, uh, you know, um, but I'm still hopeful and keeping my fingers crossed. I'm seeking more interviews, which be begs the question, um, if anyone has any referrals to people who knew Richard, people who worked with Richard, uh, any industry referrals to people who might be willing to participate in the project, either as potential interviewees um, or creatively. That would mean the world to me. Uh, it would, we need every favor we can pull. Um, we're still editing the project. We're still in the relative early stages uh, doing an assembly and uh, we've done over the years uh, a number of motion graphics, but now we're engaged in doing actual hand-drawn traditional animation cartoons to add a little bit of levity uh, to the proceedings. I'll uh, go through some of these in, in, in a little bit in the program. Uh, I'm also in early stages with uh, a music composer just to, to uh, brainstorm ideas for potential themes and such. And uh, I will say uh, the animation and the music are some of the most uh, rewarding and fun parts of this experience for me. So one question I've received, um, why pay so much attention to a movie poster artist? And uh, that's a very good question. And I'm biased in this. Uh, my perspective is, you know, from the days of handprints in caves, creating and appreciating art is something that 
defines the human existence. And uh, illustration has always been an underrated art, uh, particularly commercial in this il commercial illustration. And uh, it's unique in that those who want to be have a successful career as illustrators have to be good at it. Um, and yet it's a double-edged sword in that illustration is hardly taken as seriously as fine art. Uh, whereas fine art can be much more avant-garde or experimental. Um, you know, illustration requires skill and talent. Um, and it's kind of uh, the, the leading illustrators. Uh, there are unsung heroes as far as I'm concerned. And our documentary uh, on Richard, you know, concerns a period of time that was in many ways really the last golden age of traditional illustration uh, specific for movie posters and entertainment art. Uh, Amsel died in 1985. Uh, Bob Peake died soon after in 1990. Um, in early 2009, John Alvin died. Uh, and uh, there are still a few greats with us, people like Drew Struzan, Stephen Chorney, but um, it's a, a dying breed. And uh, so it's evocative of an era that is gone and may never come again. Um, so regarding movie poster art and my love for it, you know, um, my position is, you know, I don't really care if it's classical art, if it's fine art or commercial art, even if it is commercial, even if many people consider it to be kitsch or tacky, um, if we take joy from it, if we see beauty in it, if we can admire the skill and craftsmanship that goes into that kind of illustration, does that make it less worthy? Should we love it any less? I argue no. And uh, even if you don't like the movies themselves, many of the posters that Richard illustrated, um, you know, you can appreciate them for their own right. So uh, another question I received, how did you come to know of Richard Amsel's work? And uh, that goes back to my childhood. Um, uh, I, as a child, I was uh, a big fan of movies. I was also an aspiring artist. Um, I would never put myself in the same league as any of those greats. Um, you know, I consider myself a wannabe and I, I wear that as a badge of honor. I consider a moniker with pride, you know, call me a wannabe all you want. That's fine. But, um, you know, I just always remember seeing his work and that very distinct signature. Um, and it always stayed in the back of my mind. And uh, also his TV guide covers. Every time I'd go to the grocery store, you'd, you'd see it in the aisles and you'd recognize the signature. And I'd call out to my mom, you know, uh, mommy, mommy, look, you know, the guy who did Raiders did that. Um, and uh, she actually bought me a Cagney and Lacey TV guide issue. Not because I watched Cagney and Lacey, I was too young to appreciate it, but because it had the cover. Um, thank you, mom. Um, so Richard's work and his name just always lingered in memory. And you used to see his work everywhere. Then suddenly his work stopped. And I always wondered why. I had just assumed that he was a sage, wise old man who eventually decided to retire. Um, shortly after I moved to Los Angeles uh, in 2000, uh, USC uh, held uh, a Christie's auction of original movie poster artwork. And uh, it was there that I saw some of Richard's work in person for the first time. And it was also there that I learned of his death and also how young he was. He was only 37 years old, just a few weeks shy of his 38th birthday. He died uh, in November uh, 1985, just a few weeks after Rock Hudson. I believe Hudson died in October. So that really put his life in a different perspective to me, um, especially now that I'm older, I'm now 49. 
And uh, Richard had accomplished more with his career uh, and had more of a career by the age of 21 when he was still a student um, than I could ever imagine having. And uh, that's just something, I guess, a gift from the gods. Um, but uh, so I learned of this tragic news of his passing and how he died. He died from AIDS complications. Um, then uh, in 2008, you know, um, I'm jumping forward a number of years. Um, there was a J.C. Decker retrospective at a museum in Fullerton, California. And uh, that actually reminded me of Richard's work for The Sting, which was very J.C. Decker inspired. And Decker and, and Richard Amsels were probably my two favorite illustrators of all time. So with that exhibit, I started, it, it rekindled my interest and love of Richard's work. And I started doing a lot of homework. I went to the Motion Picture uh, Academy Library, um, trying to dig up very, very, you know, little bibli you know, biographical information was available on him. And uh, after some time and work, you know, there was no book published. There was no online, you know, no website about his work. So in 2000, early 2009, I published Richard Amsel dot info and uh, which is still there it's very ancient archaic um but that was really the first uh retrospective uh catalog of his work um and the thought of doing a documentary always lingered in my mind in around 2014 um i had begun early talks with uh members of Richard's family about working on a documentary. And by 2015, after over a year delay, uh, I finally started. Um, and the more I found out about Richard the man, uh, the more it became an obsession with me. Um, and it's not enough just to simply do a documentary about the artwork and have a bunch of talking heads talking about pretty pictures. Oh, he was a great artist, wonderful, fine. But you're not learning anything new. He was a very remarkable, complex individual. And um, so that is really the focus uh, of this project. Uh, so another question that's come in, what makes Richard Amsel's work so special? And uh, for me personally, his creative approach was unique in that while he often used photo references, he did not merely copy photos like many people do. Um, he could somehow have the supernatural power to zero in on the essence and soul of a person or a character. He imbues his work with a sense of nostalgia and beauty. Um, and he can identify, zero in on the personality and make iconic images out of them. Um, he also had a particular sensitivity to women. So take, for example, you know, one of the most iconic people he's done, Bette Midler, who is reportedly about 4'11", and he made her look like a towering giant. And uh, the art somehow matched the personality more than a photo ever could. Um, and uh, that sensitivity, I think he imbued with a lot of his subjects. Uh, you know, for example, uh, he did a poster uh, concept for a film called All Night Long with Barbara Streisand and Gene Hackman. Now, unfortunately, the artwork was not used, but it's gorgeous. And you would not consider someone like Gene Hackman to be a traditionally attractive person. Um, and uh, Bed Midler, I won't say she's not attractive. She is, but she has a, a very different look than the... Uh, masochistic, you know, male, you know, traditional, you know, mindset of what a beautiful, gorgeous woman should be. And, uh, you know, as crass as that sound, it's deliberately, uh, you know, a crass representation. Richard was able to somehow bring out the beauty of everyone and make them magical, uh, a beauty in the portraiture. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, 
So another question I've received, how did you uh, do all those animations of Richard Amsel's work? Uh, this question refers to motion graphics and you could see a number of these in the teaser trailer that we released October of last year. Um, since, I mean, I think even before I did the first interview for the project, um, I had started working on some animated motion graphics. So let me jump back a little bit. Um, I have to pay tribute and thanks to filmmaker Kevin Burke. Kevin did a film called 24 by 36. Uh, I'm briefly featured in it and I actually talk about Richard Amsel. But uh, Kevin's film uh, has these elaborate animations of the movie posters. So it's not just static images. And uh, I thought what a wonderful opportunity to present Richard's work in a new light. So I started very early um, and soon realized that if I'm going to be making a feature length film, uh, this is going to take a lot of time. So over the years, I had a number of volunteers help me and uh, I gave tutorials. Uh, and uh, so it gave me some teaching experience online, working with people all around the country. And uh, many of them have returned and over the years have come back to me, uh, continuing to volunteer their services. So to them, I'm very, very grateful. Um, and a number of them actually have skills now that uh, surpass my own. Um, and I go to them, um, asking, can you animate this or that in, in, in this method or that method? And they're able to do it better than I could. I'm actually quite jealous and envious. So uh, to segue into another question is, where did you get all your high resolution images of Amsel's work? Um, that's a very good question. They come from all different sources um, over the years. I've been working on this a long time. Uh, a number of years ago, I actually hit a jackpot where I acquired a large number of photographic transparencies that I had professionally digitally scanned and each one I would go through personally, clean them up, color correct. Um, other examples are I actually buy the poster, scan it and clean it up. And uh, I'm gonna see if I could share my screen right now. Uh, share screen. Da -da -da. Okay, sorry, that's my little outline. And I want to show you an example of the big sleep. So this is an example of a scan I did of the actual movie poster. Um, you see it has folds, the color's a little faded. So in Photoshop, I, you know, I worked at Warner Brothers for quite a number of years actually doing this on movie posters and such taking old artwork and trying to spruce it up. So here you go, it's removing the folds, tweaking the color correction, et cetera, et cetera. But I wanted to do an animation of this poster as well. And in doing so, we realized that we needed to remove all this text. There was no very good high resolution image available of the textless artwork. Uh, various other uh, variants of this poster were available where some of the, you know, some of the artwork that's beneath this text was visible, but it didn't quite match the color or the quality uh, of this image. So I asked my friend, Stephanie Mann, who uh, had helped me with some of the motion graphics over the years, can you go in kind of jigsaw puzzle some of the pieces from other sources into this background, but also do a lot of cleanup work? And can you create a textless version of this image? Stephanie went through it and did this. And when you consider that Richard's work, it's not just painting, but it has texture uh, with airbrushing and colored pencil. That's kind of a massive job right there. And we actually created an animation. Let's see, montage. Let me play this now.
So here's an example of one animation, just when we're talking about the artwork itself. You see the smoke rising from the gun and the text fading in. So I'm very proud of that. And uh, anyway, so thank you, Stephanie. And uh, another question I received, uh, someone asked, why have you removed the biography you, you wrote years ago on richardamsel.info? And again, that's the original artwork I created, not to be confused with uh, the film website, richardamselmovie.com. Um, and the reason was uh, I had uh, that biography I wrote originally in late 2008, 2009. And over the years, I found out, I, I heard many, many other testimonials. Um, and my aim is to be as accurate and thorough as possible. Um, and I realized that, unfortunately, that the bi original biography that I had drafted and that had been published for quite some time had some inaccuracies uh, or untold facts that were not known to me at the time. So uh, I removed it um, and it will reappear again, uh, revised form. Going to be doing an extensive website relaunch to coincide with a film and the eventual book, which will go into granular detail uh, about Richard's life. Um, so another question I received, how are you going to approach this? Will the film focus more on Amsel's art or the person? Um, my aim is to do both. Uh, the narrative is still coming together. Um, it's uh, obviously going, it, it's taken me a long time, but that's also a reason why it's taken so many years. Life gets in the way. Uh, there's you know, considerable research that I've done over the years, and the story is still unfolding. Uh, I'm going to go into some of that detail later, uh, but there's been a lot of drama, and we're still working on things, still researching things. Um, so, but the film will, I think, the, the main thrust of the film will be the narrative of Richard's life. The book will have that, but it will finally have an opportunity for people to see the images, many of which have never before been published. Um, I've collected thousands of images over the years uh, from, you know, scouring sources, publications, uh, many images actually were provided to me by people, artwork that I never would, that had never been published. Uh, I had received, uh, there was a wonderful portrait, for example, of Judy Garland that uh, someone bought uh, in a gallery or thrift store uh, sometime in the 1980s. And uh, I'm like, my God, that's amazing. I'd never seen that before. So... So another question has posed, um, how long, I mean, how does the fundraising process work and where does the money go? So let me explain. Uh, this project has nonprofit status through fiscal sponsorship through Fractured Atlas, which is a New York art service organization. And when I started with this project, I, I knew I was going to have to do fundraising, but it was very important to me to have complete transparency and legitimacy. Um, so that's why I thought setting this up as a nonprofit uh, would be the way to go. Uh, and uh, I wanted good karma on the project. And there was actually one would-be producer who I came to blows with over that. Uh, he was kind of in it for the money, I realized. Um, so that was one of the many reasons I gave him the boot um, and just went forward and... Uh, so the fundraising, the way uh, donations work is, uh, you know, people are able to donate to the project and uh, it's uh, we're applicable by law. You, know, you can take it as a tax deduction. We also have reward and incentive, like perks, thank you gifts um, for people who make donations. So, and over the years, I've raised uh, a little over $47,000. That might sound like a lot, but for a documentary film production like this over the course of years, that represents only about a quarter of the money that's put into it. The rest of the money has come from me. 
Um, it's largely a self-financed passion project. I ain't rich. Um, <laughs> so that's another reason why it's taken so long. I've worked various jobs in the entertainment industry throughout my career, including 12 years at Warner Brothers, uh, uh, some time at Disney, 10 years in post-production. So, but this has uh, become something of a, a passion project of mine. So where does the money go? Um, well, beyond operating costs, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, subscriptions to software such as, uh, you know, Adobe, Creative Cloud, uh, professional expenses, you know, hire a tax attorney, uh, legal, you know, uh, advice, consulting, printing, uh, even like all the press kits, mailers, PR I've done, um, that all costs a lot of money. Uh, another big expense is travel. Uh, I've traveled th through, I think, it, five to six different states. Some states I've had to travel to multiple times. I did multiple trips to the East Coast uh, over the years, trying to be as frugal as possible. But every time that happens, you know, you're dealing with airfare and car rental, et cetera, et cetera. It all adds up. But one very, very important distinction I want to make is that um, I have never collected a salary. Uh, I have reimbursed myself for some of the ex personal expenses I put in. Um, every year I'm at an operating loss. And that's not to complain. That's just to be truthful and forthcoming. But, uh, and I've paid other people for their services, including some people who, you know, we received uh, an injection of some money last year. Um, and so I was finally able to pay some of the artists and transcribers for their help. You know, uh, we've had over 60 interviews and over 100 hours of footage. We had to transcribe that. That's a lot of work. But never have I actually paid myself. So that's just a very important distinction I wanted to say. Um, next question. What are some of the biggest discoveries you've made about Richard Amsel himself? Um, I don't want to disclose everything here. Uh, I have to leave some uh, mystery. But uh, I know that uh, Richard Amsel was very soft-spoken, but at the same time, he was also very confident in his work. You know, as an artist, art artists are often very insecure, but uh, when he felt fervently uh, about how to handle a certain project, taking a certain approach, he would do it his own way. He would do his own thing, often to the detriment of losing the movie campaign. Some of his best work was never used. Uh, for example, some of my personal favorites, he did a portrait of Sally Field for the film Norma Ray. And it's this very delicate, sensitive portrait. And uh, of course the studio opted for a movie poster with photographs. Same could also be said for Coal Miner's Daughter. There was a wonderful, delicate, sensitive portrait of Sissy Spacek and Tommy Lee Jones and uh, very similar to Norma Ray. Um, and again, that was another issue where the studio in their wisdom opted to use a traditional photographic poster. And again, this is uh, in the late seventies. Um, so, you know, before illustrated movie posters really started falling out of fashion, but uh, he held to his guns and, and uh, uh, whatever insecurities he had when he believed in something, he, he pursued it and followed it. Um, another thing that I discovered was Richard was a, a huge fan of Disney and he wanted to be an animator. Um, and we've actually uh, have images of some concept illustrations and very elaborate backgrounds uh, for animated projects that never came to fruition. Uh, one person I recently interviewed was Gary Goldman, who worked with Don Bluth on The Secret of Nim, and they had been at Disney uh, for many, many years, and they famously defected in the late 70s to, to start their own animation company, because at the time that Richard moved to Los Angeles, uh, which was roughly the summer of 1985, you know, a major reason why he did that was because he wanted to try to get into animation. Um, also, movie poster art was on the decline, and he knew he was going to have to be more competitive. 
But um, unfortunately, at that time, Disney animation was on the decline and had been for a while after Walt Disney's death in, I believe, 1966. Um, it wasn't until, you know, The Little Mermaid in later in the 80s after Amsel died that uh, animation, traditional animation, was resurrected. And uh, one of the great tragedies is, you know, what if you know, it's, it's such a shame that Richard had not been able to be, be a part of that. Uh, he uh, was close friends with uh, Lily Tomlin. And Lily Tomlin had uh, that Edith Ann character, a little child's personality. And uh, Richard had actually done, he taught himself how to animate and he did a pencil test animation, a rough animation. Um, and by all accounts of the people who've seen it, it, it was wonderful. Unfortunately, that's been lost. We've spent considerable time and energy trying to find it. We don't know where it is. Um, and it's another unrealized dream that um, you know was not to be and it's a shame uh, another thing about Richard many people don't know uh, he wanted to be a photographer or rather he was an aspiring photographer and uh, photographed a number of people um, one person I was hoping to interview and I was rather crushed when uh, she passed away was Sally Kellerman um, and uh, Richard had actually photographed her. Bob Esty had shown me some photos Richard had taken of her and some photograph collections that he had. Um, so when Kellerman passed away, you know, I had been trying to reach out to her a number of times over several years. Unfortunately, some some personal personal issues in her life. You know, she suffered you know, considerable personal tragedies later in life. Her husband passed away. A child passed away. And with that, I did not want to overstep. I wanted to respect her space. And uh, then her health started to decline. And uh, so it was just one of the many interviews I had hoped to do that just never, uh, just never materialized. And I'll regret that. Um, another thing about Richard that people might be interested in knowing, uh, he had amassed a 35 millimeter film collection, uh, even including like Technicolor prints of films. And he would have uh, kind of infamous movie nights in his little uh, apartment in New York, which is like five to 600 square feet. And people would come over, he would pull down a movie theater, you know, projection, projector screen, and uh, people would gather around and uh, often smoke pot, <laughs> you know, and he would give like a little impromptu film lecture. Uh, he would show films like The Wizard of Oz or Samson and Delilah um, or Fantasia and uh, talk about the animated process for one shot to the next. Uh, Richard loved movies. He loved animation. And one of the things I want to do with this project is uh, wherever he is, uh, I hope he knows that the movies loved him back. Um Finally, uh, another realization, well, this is conjecture on my part, but uh, I talked at length with David Edward Bird, who is a celebrated artist um, and one of Richard's closest friends. And learning more about Richard over the years, his personality quirks, his behavior. You know, David often called Richard a savant, an artistic genius, but a savant who in some ways just could not, you know, was a master creatively, but other ways, just some day-to-day -day duties of reality, he had no head for. He had no head for money or finances. Um, got into a bit of trouble with the IRS over, you know, tax debt. I'll get more into that later. But discussing all this with David, I posed the question, you know, you say savant, do you think Richard might have been on the spectrum? And David thought so. Um, you know, certainly if he was, he was high functioning. But, uh, and, and so much more knowledge and research has been made into that in recent years. Uh, we'll never know, but it's possible. It's, it's kind of fun to talk about. Um, so another question, uh, this one I've received repeatedly over the years. Um, 
Have you talked to Drew Struzan about the project? Yes, uh, almost ad infinitum in some ways. Um, I had reached out to Drew a number of years ago. I wrote a very lengthy heartfelt letter and uh, he called me on the phone. And Drew has this very soft-spoken, beautiful voice. Um, you know, here on the answering machine, hi, Adam, this is Drew, you know. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, you know, I am not one who uh, gets starstruck easily. I've been working in this industry for a long time. I've met a lot of people. But uh, talking to someone like Drew or other people like William Stout, you know, uh, or Greg Hildebrandt, you know, people, artists whose work I've admired throughout my childhood, I get starstruck. But uh, so Drew, you know, and I talked and, you know, he would go on the most eloquent conversation, talking for over an hour, hour and a half, so generous with his time. Um, unfortunately, uh, Drew has had some health issues as of late. And because of that, uh, we have not been able to do an on-camera interview. But I have gotten to know him and his uh, wonderful wife, Dylan. Um, we've had numerous conversations. I've had lunch with them a few times. And I can't understate how generous they have been. Dylan is a writer, which has led us to some very, very interesting conversations. And she's uh, given me some advice on the project. You know, it's not enough to simply regurgitate facts, but to find out the narrative glue, so to speak, and the drive of Amsel's story. Uh, I was worried about making assumptions. You know, who am I to speak for Richard Amsel? I did not know him personally. I was only 12 when he died. But uh, how do I find this drive? And it was through, uh, you know, I had a certain approach and how I would handle this material in my mind. But my conversation with Dylan provided me with a cer certain eureka moment. Um, and it will shape the editing of the film. As I mentioned, Drew and Dylan, uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, my friend, Eric Sharkey, a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, who did a wonderful documentary on Drew called Drew, the Man Behind the Poster. He also did a documentary on Floyd Norman in Animated Life, uh, uh, one of the first uh, leading African-American uh, animators to work at Disney. And uh, he's working right now on a documentary on Greg Hildebrandt, who I interviewed for this project a number of years ago. And uh, so I'm wishing Eric the best of luck with that. He's actually collaborating with Kevin Burke, who did 24 by 36. And I actually interviewed Eric yesterday. Um, he was visiting LA and he was very generous with his time. He spoke about his love of Amsel, of Drew's work. And most importantly, you know, Eric is born and bred New Yorker. And uh, so he was able to speak to, uh, you know, his memories of New York, the late 70s and early 80s, uh, you know, uh, that kind of unique era and place that is no longer. Um... Now, I'm originally from the East Coast. I grew up in Connecticut and Jersey, primarily a Jersey boy. I worked in New York, went to school in New York, but, uh, you know, I've been in California too long. And uh, Eric was able to speak to that time and place better than I ever could. So thank you, Eric. Next question. What was the biggest challenge you've had with this project so far? Um, from a logistic standpoint, finding time and money. Um, uh, I've also been applying to grants, which is a very tedious, cumbersome project, uh, a process uh, and doing fundraising. I'm not much of a showman, you know, um, uh, I, over the years, I, you know, I try through social media and certainly the Richard Amsel movie.com website to generate interest and take people on the journey as I'm making this film. You know, it's not enough to simply do the film and then bang to a website to promote it. I wanted people to experience, uh, the journey I've gone through with this project. And uh, and again, every dollar that people donate has helped enormously. It's put to good use. So, you know, finances, logistics, um, in terms of the biggest challenge creatively, it's trying to reconcile all the conflicting stories that I've heard over the years. 
And again, this documentary is like um, unraveling a mystery or solving a puzzle where all the pieces don't exactly fit. Um, and there's also the need to document remembrances while we still can. Many of the people who knew Richard personally are now in their 70s and 80s. Um, three people who I've interviewed have since died. And uh, it's, you know, so that's a wake up call to me. I, I know it's not just no longer about Richard's legacy. It is about honoring them and their trust and faith in me, because it takes a lot to to earn the trust of people to participate in this project. Uh, some people have been very forthcoming and given, you know, testimonials that are very raw and telling or emotional. Uh, many of them are survivors of the AIDS era who have lost dozens of friends. And it's very hard for them. Um, one person in particular, I took several years before uh, I even heard back from him. And then more time before I actually was able to interview. And he gave a very emotionally raw, heartfelt interview. And by the time we were done, we were both in tears. So... Um, so also, uh, and I have to say this, uh, for those of you who follow up on my blog on the film, there has been considerable, I had drama with, uh, Richard Amsel's family. Uh, again, for the first year I tried working with them and, uh, you know, I don't want to name names or go into great detail, but, uh, it came to the point where the project would not happen. Um, a collaboration was impossible. And uh, there was still an open invitation to members of the Amsel family. I actually do have one member of the Amsel family who I interviewed last year. And uh, she actually tracked me down and reached out to me. And she was very telling and forthcoming and honest in uh, her remembrances about the family. And for that, I'm very, very grateful because that was a, a major coup um, and kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, another big challenge, and this is also a major factor why this film is still in process, progress, a story that's still unraveling. What happened to Richard's work after he died? And again, I'm not going to name names here. Um, it's also a subject that I don't know how much attention I will have to pay to in the film. It's something I'm going to address. How much I don't know. It really warrants a film in and of itself in many ways. And, uh, it, you know, in, it's not uncommon when you have a major artist or illustrator who's passed away and there's uh, uh, infighting among the family. There are different claims of ownership, et cetera, et cetera. You know, fantasy illustrator Frank Franzetta is a famous example. There's also a great documentary um, called The Art of the Steel, which deals with the Barnes collection. Uh, uh, Barnes had amassed this huge collection of uh, probably the greatest collection, private collection of artwork uh, in history. And what happened after his death, how that was, what happened was not what he wanted. <clears throat> uh, I do know that a lot of what happened with Richard's work after he passed away was not what he wanted. Um, so will I go into that? Yes. Uh, someone has asked a more general question. What do you hope to achieve with a project? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I want Richard Amsel's work to be remembered, first and foremost. I want to preserve, I want to preserve his creative legacy. I don't want to own it. Um, most importantly, uh, I want to tell the story of the man himself and the times in which he lived. This is not just a story of a movie poster artist. It's a personal story. And uh, it's the, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, entertainment, Hollywood glamour, glitz, celebrity friendships, personal heartbreak, unrealized dreams. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the rise of the gay rights movement and Stonewall was just in the late 60s, you know, when Amsel had moved to New York. And then uh, eventually going into the rise of AIDS in the face of the Reagan era and how devastating that was. Um, 
and not just to the gay community, but to arts in general. And the pain and the scars uh, are still there. They will never heal. And uh, there will always be considerable justified anger over that. Richard was one of millions uh, you know, whose life was extinguished. But uh, I hope his star still shines brightly. Um, so another question that's come in, and I'm going to, you know, some of these questions are, are rather, you know, uh, forthcoming. So I'm going to, they, someone poses an honest question. I'm going to give them an honest answer. Um, why do you think you can speak for Richard or be the one to tell his story? So it's a very good question. Uh, I don't think I can speak for Richard. Um, who am I to presume? The best I can do is through the context of all the remembrances I've heard, try to be as forthcoming and truthful as possible. Um, I cannot speak for Richard, but someone has to. Now, am I the best person to tell his story? Of course not. Um, you know, I've, this is my first feature film I've directed in the past. I've done short films and worked on documentaries for a number of years, but uh, I've never taken on a project this big or this detailed, so much more involved than I ever could have imagined. Uh, and I am not the, I don't have the most resource, most resources. I'm certainly not the most talented, but the simple truth remains. I am the only person better or worse uh, who has taken the initiative to do something and um, I did not know Richard, but it's very important that people understand that Richard's work meant something to me. Um, and this is a project that I have invested considerable years of my life and resources into, and I don't regret that at all. I'm not in this for the money. I never have been. No one sets out to make a documentary saying, ooh, you know. Uh, I'm going to be, you know, pulling in the box. No, no. If you can get out of the red and get in the black, you're lucky. That's a pipe dream. I just want people to know and appreciate his work and better understand and know the man behind the signature. So uh, another question. In your blogs, you've briefly mentioned some of the issues that you've had with the Amsel family. What happened and are they a part of the project? Well, I kind of touched base on this a little bit earlier. Um, again, I tried working with them for over a year. I handed all my work, all my research, all my contacts. This was not reciprocated in any way. And I was met with initially delay, 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 uh, demands, and then resistance. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, some of the testimonials I heard at that time were completely forthcoming. And uh, so it was necessary for me to just move on, take my work and do the project. Um, and again, there is still an open invitation for members of the Amsel family to participate in the project. I, I just spoke with uh, another member of the family uh, just the other day. Again, uh, conversations that have been going off and on for years. Will anything come of it? I don't know. But uh, again, I did have uh, another member of the family uh, talk to me last summer. And for that, I'm very grateful. Um, so um, my intention with this, first and foremost, is to give as accurate and thorough an account as possible. And this kind of segues into the next question. What gives you the right to air the family's dirty laundry or Richard's dirty laundry? Uh, the project is designed as a valentine to Richard Amsel and his work. But I also have a responsibility to the truth. Richard Amsel was a funny, witty, sweet, kind person, but he was not a saint. And, uh, you know, he did just fascinating personality uh, with his eccentricities and quirks. Um, but I've talked to a number of people who knew him in different ways. And uh, one thing that I've heard is that he often compartmentalized his friends. This was not done out of cruelty, 
it was just something in his nature where he kept his art friends separate from his casual friends. Um, and some of the people, for example, who knew Richard in his early career or as students, you know, uh, life gets in the way and they lost touch and uh, they felt somehow inadvertently hurt by Richard. The fact that the, the friendship just drifted away and it wasn't out of malice or cruelty. Um, all the things I've heard about Richard, and he he could be witty, he could even be bitchy, but I doubt he was ever cruel. But again, he inadvertently hurt some people, and uh, I want to be able to talk about that as well and express that aspect of his personality uh, with his different friends. And again, over the year, I've interviewed everyone from early childhood to high school to people who knew him in college several classmates, even one of his teachers I was able to interview. Um, so as for the dirty laundry uh, and the family drama, you know, um, to the family who say that, uh, you know, I'm not the one who sullied it. Uh, so I just have to be truthful. And uh, if the truth hurts, it's, you know, they say if, if you're hurt by the truth, you have no one but yourself to blame. Uh, that said, and you know, I'm being harsh here, uh, truth is often not black and white, but shades of gray. And it's easy to paint history or a personal story in broad strokes. And the truth is far more nuanced. I'm not out to make any personal attacks or hit pieces. Every family has its dynamics. And I do know that Richard's family, uh, members of Richard's family, you know, had tried reaching, particularly his mother had tried reaching out to him after the estrangement. Um, but uh, it's also important to remember, this is a man who was only 37 when he died. And by all, you know, many accounts, he was still a kid. You know, he's been described as something of like Peter Pan, someone who never really grew up. And while he had many loves and loved people greatly, um, I don't think he ever had one true great love or a muse. You know, this is something I actually spoke with at length with uh, Dylan Struzan. You know, Dylan is something I think of Drew's muse. Um, and uh, she's, she's a brilliant storyteller, wonderful writer, but she's able to articulate things in a certain way. And she also has a good head on her shoulders business-wise, a certain acumen uh, that an artist might not have and lets the artist be free to do his own thing. And uh, it would have been nice if Richard had someone like that. Uh, certainly, you know, a name that's come up frequently, and I talk about this in, recently in the blog, Gary Brelo was a lifelong friend of Richard's. And uh, it was to Gary who Richard left everything in his will. Gary is something of the unsung hero of the Richard Amsel story. And uh, he was the one who maintained a large collection of his work and uh, was fighting to preserve his legacy and was developing a book. So uh, sadly, Gary himself passed away from AIDS complications in April, 1990. Um, I'm happy to say I was able to track down uh, members uh, of his family who are very fully supportive of this project. So thank God. Um, so this also uh, goes into the next question. Can you talk about the development of a book and why hasn't there been one yet? Um, in full disclosure, I'm going to be handling the book more hands-on after I finish the film. I could really only dedicate so much time uh, to a project and uh, it's necessary for me to work on the film first. Also, so much of the research that I am doing uh, on the film is going to segue into and be repurposed in the book itself. So, and again, the story is still unraveling. Um, however, that you know, uh, I have been in contact. Three potential publishers have reached out to me uh, about a book on Amsel's work. And uh, this will be a completely separate endeavor from the film, uh, particularly regarding fundraising uh, for legal reasons. You know, it's essential that I keep the film and the book separate. Um, but also unlike a film, excuse me, you know, 
uh, you know, I'd love to be able to have a major publisher do a nice big coffee table art book. <laughs> but worst case scenario, you know, the technology for print on demand is there now that wasn't available even, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. You can do, you know, a nice print on demand art book um, that is a quality one. Uh, one person I talked to at length about was Tom Peak, who is one of the sons of the late Bob Peak, a famous illustrator uh, who Amsel admired very much. Tom had published a book on his uh, father's work and he took it upon himself. He came into it fresh. And, uh, but he, he's done a beautiful book. I've talked to some other artists who, who've done similar books. And uh, my friend David Bird uh, is having a book published, I think, later this year uh, called Poster Child. And uh, I'm very excited about that. That's, that's David's legacy uh, that uh, I hope will be preserved and cherished. I certainly cherish my friendship with David. So another question, we're wrapping it up soon. Um, will you be addressing the large collection of Richard Amsel's artwork at the University of the Arts and how they came to acquire it? Yes. Um, this deals with what happened to Richard's work after he died uh, and the Amsel estate. Uh, I had mentioned Gary Brelo and his family who are fully on board with this project. Um, it has been a contentious issue. Um, how much I'm going to deal with this in the film or the book has yet to be determined. Again, I'm not necessarily out to name names uh, or do any character assassinations, but I have to be truthful and forthcoming. And uh, I'm very, very happy that some of the Richard's classmates and one of the teachers at the University of the Arts have participated in this project wholeheartedly. Uh, the University of the Arts itself has been completely uncooperative. I'll just say that and leave it there. Um, last question. What are the biggest uh, revelations you're willing to reveal today? Well, that I haven't already discussed. Um, first, and my editor is going to kill me when he hears this. Um, uh, this may not be a feature documentary. This, I, I think we might even have enough material. I have to see how it comes together. Even a multi-part series. Um, we really have to see, it might even be both, but we have so many hours of footage to go through and uh, I wanna see how it takes form, but uh, there's more than enough material there for at least a two, perhaps three part series. And certainly with the advent of, you know, streaming and the popularity of it now, you know, documentaries are, you know, so accessible. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, another revelation, um, and I'll close with this before taking open questions. Uh, I am working with an art curator on developing a potential retrospective art show of Richard's work in Los Angeles. There has not been one yet exclusively of his work. Now, in the past, there have been other shows. Uh, my friend Randall Tolbert, uh, who I interviewed, uh, and he had done some early work with the late Gary Brelo on developing a book. Uh, he had done his own little private show, uh, I think in uh, North Carolina back in 2007 or 2008. And then there was another uh, show uh, by the University of the Arts, a retrospective of Richard's work, which is very, very thorough and has, um, you know, an, an, amassed an amazing collection of his work. Only a few of those things I've seen. And uh, that collection is not available to the public. We've requested many, many times over the years. Every time we've been denied, it's infuriating. But uh, as I've said, I've amassed thousands of images, many of which have not been published. They're not even yet available on the Richard Amsel dot info website. They're trickling out on the Richard Amsel movie dot com website. Uh, for example, some artwork for uh, the champ, the 1979, um, as well as some unused artwork for films like Greystoke uh, or Yentl. Uh, 
And uh, uh, there was even, uh, you know, probably the highest profile poster Richard had done that was not used was for uh, Terms of Endearment. And uh, uh, that's available on the website. So um, I'm really, I really hope we can pull this show off. We're still in early talks and trying to develop something, but I'm uh, working with someone who's, who's very talented. And uh, I really hope that comes to fruition. Um, so I'm going to open the floor to questions uh, and then we'll call it a day. So I'm unmuting those who are on. I have uh, Rick and Merv Block. Can you guys hear me? Do you have any questions you want to pose? No, just congratulations on an extraordinary presentation. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I have, uh, you could probably make a good drinking game out of every time I say, um, or I cough, you know, uh, it would be a toxic drinking game and I can't assume any legal responsibility for those of you who pass out. Any and questions? I can tell you, this is Rick. I can only tell you that if, and when that book gets done, you made three sales right here. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I get asked all the time. I mean, since I launched the website, it, that is the one question I've received the most. Yeah, inquiries. yeah. I mean, probably several hundred times I've been asked, will there be a book? So uh, as soon as I had worked out a contract with Gary Brelo's estate, that was in 2002. That took a bit of time, not because it was contentious or that we were arguing. It was just, uh, you know, life got in the way and people were busy. But, uh, you know, I mean, they've been... They've been on board, you know, uh, I'll say his name, Howard Feinberg. He's Gary Brelo's nephew. And uh, I found out like, you know, I, I heard his name and I found him through LinkedIn. Uh, and I started with a very awkward question. Did you know Richard Amsel was Gary Brelo, your, your uncle? And he said, yes. And we hit it off right away. And I posed the suggestion is like, you could conceivably be the rightful heir to the Richard Amsel estate. Mm. And to my surprise, Howard didn't seem shocked by that. He's like, we always wondered, but no one ever bothered all these years. No one ever reached out to us, us being Gary's family after Gary died. And uh, some artwork that Gary had had disappeared after his death. Uh, I don't wanna say stolen because if I say that I'll probably get sued and I can't actually say stolen, but I will say disappeared or exchanged hands. Um, and the family was too consumed with dealing with Gary's passing, um, to really give it much thought, but, uh, I'm very, very happy that to have their blessing and have them on board, both for the film and the book. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes with a project like this, you can have a crisis of conscience, you know, I'm not out to hurt anyone, but, uh, when you're, you know, making when you're trying to dig for the truth, you know, uh, sometimes you could rub people the wrong way. It's not my intention, but sometimes it happens. And I just have to continue going as truthfully as I can. And I'm not giving up. And if it's a question of showing this film online for free, not, you know, if it comes to that, I will. But I am making this movie. And I will make it available to people to see one way or another. Um, I put too much of my life, too much of my blood, sweat, and tears into this. And this is not a pity party. This is something I enjoy doing. I relish doing it. It's given me joy and purpose. And uh, I just hope I can honor his memory and his legacy the best I can. Any other questions? Well, Okay, well, we'll call it a day. I want to thank you guys for your participation and uh, I'll be posting this shortly online. So I will send everyone the link when it's available. Thanks again for participating. And uh, again, check out richardampselmovie.com. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter to keep abreast on all our progress and news updates. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have various fundraising initiatives. Uh, we could certainly use all the help we can get. Um, but I thank you, everyone, from the bottom of my heart, whether you're contributing a dollar or karma 
or your energy and talent to this project. It means the world to me and I cannot do it without you. Thank you very much. I'm Adam McDaniel.